Big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them. Little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. The Victorian era mathematician Augustus de Morgan wrote these words as an allegory for self-similarity, the idea that things of vastly different size are often superficially similar. Basically, it means that patterns repeat themselves. For example, solar systems and atoms. The idea of self-similarity applies to many fields of human knowledge, but it has a special place in our modern understanding of the smallest bits of matter. The ancient Greek philosophers were among the first to think seriously about the question of the building blocks of the universe, with Empedocles offering the four elements of air, fire, water, and earth, and Democritus suggesting tiny, indivisible objects called atomos, from which our word atom originates. In the last couple of centuries, we have made great strides in our understanding of just what is the smallest object in the universe. First molecules, then atoms, and protons, neutrons, and electrons, and now finally, quarks and leptons. Quarks are found inside protons and neutrons, and the most important and familiar lepton is the electron. So where do we stand? Are quarks and leptons the final word, or are they just a way station in our journey to find the smallest constituents of the universe? Well, what do we know? The picture off to my left embodies our current best understanding. There are six quarks with kind of silly names called up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom. The up and down quarks are found in ordinary matter but the others are unstable, existing for only short fractions of a second before decaying and found only inside particle accelerator collisions. In addition, we have three charged leptons called electrons, muons, and taus, as well as three neutral leptons called neutrinos, the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. So let's take another look at this graphic. We have up and down quarks and electrons that make up matter. So why are there four other kinds of quarks and two other charged leptons? When the muon was found, Nobel Prize winning physicist I. I. Rabi is reported to have said, who ordered that? It turns out that there are commonalities in the quarks and leptons. The charm quark has the same charge as the up quark, but it's heavier. Similarly, the top quark has the same charge, but it's heavier still. In the same way, the strange and bottom quark have the same charge as the down quark, with the ones on the right having a higher mass. This pattern is repeated with the charged leptons as well. It's a little trickier to talk about neutrinos, but they are paired with their respective lepton, so we can group them in a comparable pattern. You'll notice that there appear to be three distinct carbon copies of the quarks and leptons, and we number them one, two, and three. The quarks and leptons of generation one are found in ordinary matter, and the others are only found in accelerators. Nobody has any real idea why there are two other generations, but in my opinion, this is the first real evidence suggesting that quarks and leptons might not be the final story in the saga of the search for the ultimate building blocks. There is a historical precedent for this pattern. In the 1860s, Dmitry Mendeleev invented the periodic table of chemical elements. You may remember from chemistry class. Each column consists of elements with similar chemical properties. For instance, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon are noble gases. They'd interact very little. In contrast, the column of hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on are all very reactive substances. In short, the columns are similar. In contrast, as we move down the columns, the atomic mass of the elements grows heavier. Although this wasn't clear when the periodic table was proposed, these commonalities were the first indication of atomic structure. We now can explain these patterns as atoms of a particular column having similar arrangements of electrons, and the increase in mass comes from having more protons and neutrons in the atomic nucleus. We can contrast the quark and lepton periodic table with a chemical one. In the chemical table, columns are chemically similar, and moving down the rows means more mass. While in the quark and lepton version, the rows are similar particles, with the mass increasing as you go from column 1 to 2 to 3. 
This pattern is suggestive of the idea that perhaps something new is to be found inside quarks and leptons. But you should be careful. I use the word suggestive on purpose. There is no agreement by scientists that these particles must contain smaller particles within them. Indeed, the standard model, which is our best theory of the subatomic world, treats the quarks and leptons as point-like particles with zero size and nothing inside them. So what has our experimental work told us? Well, when we've looked for constituents of the quarks and leptons, we've never found any evidence supporting the idea. We know that if the quarks and leptons have a size, that size is smaller than one ten thousandth the size of a proton, smaller than 10 to the minus 19 meters. That's about as small compared to an atom as an atom is compared to you. There have been theories advanced for particles smaller than quarks and leptons. The name for these tiny hypothetical particles is prions. However, the prion idea is not a popular one. Don't believe it. But it's a cool idea. Another idea for which there is no experimental evidence is the theory of superstrings. According to this idea, there are objects called strings that are the smallest constituents of matter. These tiny strings are like little sticks of spaghetti or little hula hoops that vibrate. The familiar particles are just different vibrations of the strings, with an up quark perhaps being a B flat and a an electron being a, an F-sharp. Again, don't believe in superstrings, but it's also a really cool idea. So what is the answer? Well, frankly, I don't know. The best response to that question comes from Einstein when he said, if I knew what I was doing, then it wouldn't be called research. Still, the search for the ultimate building blocks has a history of over two millennia, and scientists will continue to look for them. The patterns of the periodic table of quarks and leptons are highly suggestive, and we will continue to study this timeless question.